Hello and welcome to News Click. We have with us today Professor Rajaz Ahmed and we'll discuss the situation that's emerging between Iran and the United States on the nuclear issue and on the Straits of Hormuz. Rajaz, good to have you with us. Thank you very much. Good to be back. Iran and the United States seem to be now locked into a collision course. There's what the United States are, is asking is really that Iran gives up its nuclear capability, uh, which is actually allowed to it under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And Iran obviously cannot do that. Do you think there is any solution to what is emerging except a long-term standoff and possibly descending into a shooting war? My sense, Prabir, is that, uh, that there is really no solution because what the Americans really want is a regime change. Underlying that is the... Uh, that, is, that is the real objective. They don't know how to break Iran. They have put such draconian sanctions in place that they hope to break the economy of Iran through those sanctions. Uh, and my sense actually is that sanctions of this kind never hurt a regime. In fact, the population then coalesces behind the regime on patriotic grounds and so on. It hurts the population as such. My sense is actually that if we were living in a lawful world, sanctions of this kind, which are essentially genocidal in character, which have not been mandated by the United Nations Security Council or any such authority, would probably constitute uh, um, an international crime. This would be, in, in some sense, an act of war. It is an act of war and uh, genocidal intent. That's why I'm saying that it's probably uh, a war crime uh, in, if we were living in a lawful world, which unfortunately we are not. So, of course, there is no solution. The question is, what are the possibilities right now? My sense is that, the, that President Obama, to simplify matters, President Obama wants to play two cards. On the one hand, the peace president, who has ended the war in Iraq, who is winding up the war in Afghanistan, and a war president who is throttling this grand enemy, the great Satan of Iran. So that's, that's how he is positioning himself in the forthcoming elections. And in the United States, unfortunately, although the elections are due in November, um, the, all the hype about the elections has already started some months ago, and within a month or so, it will be very much almost at the point of hysteria. So that's one sort of thing that is going on. The other thing is that we now know from the highest authorities, in the retired chief of Mossad, for instance, two retired chiefs of Mossad by now, who have uh, told us the facts that in, in 2010, the three chiefs of the three major intelligence services in, uh, in Israel, backed by the head of the Israeli armed forces, prevented Netanyahu and Barak from uh, attacking Iran. So the intent to attack Iran is very great on the part of the political establishment in Israel. If anyone inside Israel is preventing them, it's the intelligence agencies and perhaps elements in the armed forces. It's perfectly possible, and I think that is where the real danger comes. It's perfectly possible that in this election year, Israel might, in fact, carry out the kind of uh, strikes that it says uh, it has been preparing for and force the hands of the U.S. The problem in the U.S., my sense is, actual problem, aside from this electionary, is that there, there seems to be a deep dissension. The military seems to be um, very serious. Uh, military analysts, American military analysts, Robert Sales and others, um, have said that they know that the, uh, the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, of the United States actually went and complained to Obama that he was not leaning on Netanyahu strong enough, that he should understand that the U.S. military is dead set against it. That is why the Defense Secretary, Panetta, has gone on record saying that, the, that Iran is not building nuclear a nuclear weapon, right? What we do know also from these same people, the uh, military analysts, is that there has actually been going on the exercises just in case 
the Israel attacks, what, how is the United States going to support Israel in that case? Uh, and how is it going to defend itself? Because the retaliation will come against the U.S. installations in the Gulf Council countries. Um, so they are doing that. And by the way, uh, it is also reported um, very reliably that the two most senior generals have briefed Obama saying that in case of an Israeli attack, the U.S. will need 45 to 90 days to scramble up all its forces to be able to retaliate against Iran uh, actions. So the army, on the one hand, really just does not want to do it. On the other hand, it is being ordered to make all kinds of, of uh, preparations. I won't go into further you know, uh, details, but there is a, an enormous body of information showing how serious uh, uh, weaponry has been prepositioned by the United States uh, in, in, in the region. Uh, it is said that, in, uh, just to give you one example, that Diego Garcia base now has about 300 of the most advanced uh, bunker buster weapons that the United States has in its arsenal uh, to go and invade in Iran everywhere. You know, just when I look at this whole scenario, one part of it is militarily what can happen. That's really right. if it goes into a shooting war. The other part of it is if if they don't go and get into war, there must be a mechanism by which they can not fight. Yeah. Now, what I see currently is the United States has absolutely no avenue except to lock Iran down as they're doing to sanctions and other things till Iran retaliates in some form or the other, which will then break out into open war. Right. Now, right. this is really what the United States is doing. So even if the intent is not to get into shooting war, I do not see there is any other way that it can be resolved. And therefore, over a period of time, it can only result in finally some small act here or there, or Israel, as you said, uh, doing something. Forcing by which hand. it Forcing the hands, which it gets yeah. into war. Yeah. You, see, you see, Americans have actually trapped themselves into their own rhetoric. These sanctions, for example. And it's interesting, the uh -huh. United States didn't want it initially. Uh, well, the United States didn't want it initially. In fact, the Obama administration briefed the Reuters on 9th November that under no circumstances will the United States target the Iranian central bank because that will upset the oil prices and so on and so forth. November, that is. And the next thing you know, a unanimous resolution in the U.S. Senate asking precisely or mandating precisely those that targeting, and then the House of Representatives and so on. So again, you have, you know, the, the, the U.S. administration divided over, you know, some basic things of that kind. Now, you see, the thing is that Russia, China, Japan, uh, we are told India, I, we, I don't know, but certainly major countries, certainly all of Latin America and so on, are not going to abide by these uh, sanctions. You see, the point is, even if they don't abide by the sanctions, the threat of sanctions against them, and this is what happened to India, Precisely. will mean that the getting Iranian oil is okay, but you can't pay for it because the State Bank of that's India right, had problems. That's right, that's right. And now we have gone to Turkish Bank, and I was going to come to that. Now we are approaching a Russian bank. Now, this is the risk that they carry. Right. Now, the thing is that between Japan and Russia, I think a mechanism will be found. What are you going to do? Uh, you're going to, to put sanctions on Japanese banks, whom you owe enormous amounts of money? And then, uh, the very things that the Americans are doing has already pushed up petroleum prices. If petroleum prices go up further, keep going up, even if Iran is selling less and less, its reven oil revenues are It'll going increase. to rise. <laughs> you know? But you know, that, that, that brings up the next issue, really, that if Iran has to cut back due to sanctions on the amount of oil it can sell, that gap in oil production today cannot be met 
by others. That, you know, Saudi Arabia has already grabbed, uh, revved up its production, and you are going to see, therefore, a demand-driven uh, oil price rise. Yes. You don't even have to deal with real quantities. This is specula speculation, a speculative market. Okay. If, if there is such military and political uncertainty, prices will go, keep going up just on that. You know, you know, in a year which is really supposedly the key year for economic recovery, either we go into a double deep recession or the, the global economy re recovers. We already have an economic crisis of the sovereign debt crisis in, United, in uh, Europe. On top of that, isn't this really playing with the entire globe's future? Absolutely, yes, yes, of course, of course. Uh, let, you know, again, um, the asymmetrical behavior. Um, Americans are now making a huge big thing about this, uh, the, uh, Iran wanting to, uh, to uh, to enrich uranium up to 19.50%. Uh, uh, which is for the research, medical research. For reaction. medical research from which 78,000 Irani patients of cancer benefit. Okay. If they can't do it, this is what I mean by genocidal intent on the, behind these sanctions and so forth. Now, Iranis have said quite openly that all you have to do is to give us this much, and we won't. If you want us not to do it, just give us this. Uh, uh, you know, there's an association of nuclear scientists or something in the United States. The head of it has actually written a letter to Obama saying that if you, if you could give them 50 kilograms of it as a humanitarian gesture, it will go very well with the Iranian population and de-escalate all of this. Uh, nons right. nonsense and they will stop doing it you know so the idea that you could provoke Iran to do something irrational and then that you could use that that is not going to happen another assassination of an Iranian nuclear scientist has come about since la January 2010 there have been about six such assassinations of eminent once there have been explosions all over, so there is actually an, a war going on. A cyber a, a war, various kinds cyber war, assassinations, explosions, violations of Iranian airspace. Yeah, to violations drones. of Iranian. Yeah, so so acts of war are going on, uh, extremely provocative, extremely provocative. You you keep assassinating some of their key scientists. Do they have the right to retaliate by assassinating somebody? They have threatened that if, if you really impose such draconian sanctions, we will uh, block the, uh, the uh, states of hormones. Um, I don't think so. I think there will have to be an actual act of war for them to do it. Because that's the sort of thing that the Americans are really looking for as an excuse to go in. One of the reasons we are locked down into this kind of a you know, crisis or really not being able to get out of this is that we sent this whole damn thing from IAEA to the United Nations Security Council, Absolutely. where now you know, you know United, even the United States cannot Absolutely. get it out. Absolutely. Now that would not have happened if India had not voted in Absolutely. IAEA, they did. Absolutely. Absolutely. Subsequently, the country which is going to be hurt the most is probably likely to be India because 70% of our oil comes from the states of Hormuz. 11% of India's oil comes from Iran today. So in case of sure, war, sure, the country which is going sure. to be most affected be is actually, uh, be actually India. India. Don't you think that India should now, given the fact that it has played a role of this kind in the past, at least now come back to the path of sanity and assert like Brazil and Turkey did earlier yeah. that we need to settle this peacefully. We have the maximum at stake. It, it should actually refuse to abide by the sanctions and defy the United States and say, all right, you, you, uh, you put sanctions against our banks and we'll see what we can do. And also rally independent yeah. international opinion now Absolutely. on this issue. Yeah. Yeah. Because unless India does it, the European Union is not going to do it. No, no, not European. You know, European Union, the French Foreign Ministry has just issued a statement saying that the very existence of missile technology in Iran is a threat to peace. The very existence of missile technology. 
Iran is not supposed to have any technology. <laughs> the, all the rest of the world can have it. Iran is simply not a sovereign country. <laughs> I mean, this is this is this is this is France. Unless you India goes back into constructing or strengthening or whatever a coalition of forces across the three continents, um, uh, Asia, Africa, and Latin America, to take initiatives of the of the kind that you were referring to, that Brazil and and uh, Turkey did at that, uh, in the past, we could in fact in initiate an initiative with South Africa, Brazil, um, uh, Russia, and China Russia, well. Russia and China, Venezuela, whatever, initiated uh, one uh, saying, uh, you, you can't uh, do this sort of thing, uh, this kind of sanctions which hurt the global economy, uh, the, con the national economy of all our countries, as well as glo global economy at this point. You just can't do this kind of sanctions. Uh, or that these sanctions can only have validity. We will observe by them only if the Security Council, in fact, imposes them. You know, we have come to a peculiar situation in the world today. Nothing can happen on climate change, United States domestic policy. Right. Nothing can happen in Iran, United States domestic policies. We seem to be still held hostage and every major international yeah. issue today yeah. hostage to the domestic politics yeah. Yeah. of the of the United States and if I may say so the lunatic right <laughs> route right wing fringe of the Republican Party absolutely which is which is what 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 is driving uh, American domestic policy uh, and I I actually do not see what the quid pro quo has been it's not as if you know by taking this position on Iran you got such and such it is only the Americans saying, if you don't do it, we'll pun punish you. We'll punish you. Uh, you unilaterally withdraw from that uh, uh, you pipeline. Know, pipeline. Uh, what did you get out of it? A promise that someday you might get some pipeline through Pakistan, through from Afghanistan, and through Afghanistan or something. Um, in Afghanistan, they're changing their scenarios. Where are we in this? So there is no quid pro quo to this subservience. Yeah, I think there we have been held hostage. The Indian political situation has been held hostage to Manmohan Singh's desire for a nuclear deal. And for that, he's willing to forego everything, but, including but, but, the but vital oil needs of the country. Okay, but, oh, all right. Okay, okay. If, if that is the case, you got that nuclear deal. Now, now your economy is going to get throttled if this war a like situation in the states of Homer's develops. Are you now going to take an initiative on any of that? That thing is gone. Okay. Good question to ask the Prime Minister. Yeah. Two years later? Of, of the country today. <laughs> Two years later, can we do something about this to save our economy? Thank you, Ajaz. I think Iran is going to be on the horizon the way it's going for quite some time. And we'll return to this again in issue again on News Click. Thank you. Thank you.